Well, good morning, Eagle Point Church family and friends. If you weren't born with a phone in your hand, this is a calendar. And there's a very special date on this calendar. Sunday, May 31st. That's next Sunday. That's the day that we all get to come together here in this building at Eagle Point Church. You should be getting a letter telling you how to prepare, what to expect, but it's going to be good. Also wanted to remind you that on Monday nights at 7 o'clock, Jerry and I spend a little time with you on Facebook Live. We usually have our cat. She's the star of the show. Then on Thursday at 7 o'clock is Michael and Rachel Blessingang. And they've been talking about our Bible 260 program. That is where we read one chapter a day through the weekdays. And then at the end of the year, we will have read the whole New Testament. Well, right now we're in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is like an epic movie. It's so exciting. There is shipwrecks and snake bites. There's riots and trials. There's amazing speeches. Paul gives a speech before King Agrippa and Stephen gives a speech before the Jewish council. They're so moving and so compelling through the speeches of their lives. God's Word is so amazing and so wonderful. So join Michael and Rachel and find out about that. You know, we never want to be without God's Word and we never have to. And today, we're going to sing God's Word and we're going to hear God's Word. So let's come on in here for the very last time like this. Come with me and let's see what God has for us from His Word. Come on, last time. Good morning and welcome to our online service at Eagle Point Church. We hopefully are planning to be back together next week right here in our sanctuary. And I'm definitely looking forward to that. Right now, I hope that you will just join in and sing with us as we sing Believer.
Good morning, Eagle Point Church. I'd like to join Penny and the worship team in welcoming you to our, hopefully, maybe, our last online service. We're hoping to uh, come back to church in like a, um, maybe a little different form, but we'll, we'll be gathering hopefully in the building next week on the 31st, Lord willing, and uh, there's no changes, you know, no changes from the governor or, or the, you know, anything like that, so... Hopefully, we'll be able to see you guys next week in person. Um, I would like to encourage you uh, once again to, to continue to give, to return your tithes to the Lord and to give your offerings to the Lord. Uh, we have numerous different ways now to give. One is through Faith Life. One is through Easy Tithe. Another is the old-fashioned snail mail. You can write a check out and send it to the mail in our P.O. box. Um, and I think there's even a text to tithe now, I think. Um, and so there, there are four different ways to give uh, to Eagle Point. Thank you so much for your support as we've been in a really strange time uh, where we've not been able to come together physically. The church has really risen to the occasion and you've continued to faithfully give. And so uh, on behalf of Pastor Jerry and, and Greg and the Elder Guidance team, I would love to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Now, let's go to the Lord in prayer, but before we pray, I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. <clears throat> this can be found in Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3 and verse 6. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, as we continue to worship... We do want to lift you up and give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. That's, it belongs to you and only you, Lord. Father, I pray that you would continue to be with us as we've uh, just, you know, continue to experience strange times. Um, and I know that there will be change in, in, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, but Lord, help us to deal with that change and help us, Father, to, to lean on you and lean into you like never before. Help us, Father, to be your church like never before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
In number 6, 22 to verse 26, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. This message may have been for the Israelites, but it's also for the church today. God wants to continue to bless us. There's also a time where God is giving Moses the Ten Commandments, and he says in Exodus 20, starting in verse 4, You shall not make for yourself an image of any kind, or an image of anything in the heavens, or the earth, or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, and will not tolerate your affection for any other God. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is afflicted. Even children to the fourth and third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Now listen to this next verse. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Wow, that's how good God is. So this morning we're going to sing a song called The Blessing. So I just want you to receive the blessing that God wants to pour out on our church and specifically for your family today.
Good morning. Welcome to Eagle Point Church of God. Glad we had another tremendous morning of, of worship and had a great welcome, and I'm glad you're here. Hey, we've been stacking these services together. I don't know how many we've been going exactly like this. I mean, we talked among us here just for a moment. I didn't know if it's 7 or 8 or 11 or what, but I'm glad you're here this morning. It looks like very possibly, probably, we're making plans for us to, to gather. The church has been deployed, and we're going to have a gathering uh, a week from today. And so look forward to that. If you need details, you can contact Connie. Uh, hopefully you received a letter. If you looked on some of our online opportunities to kind of see the details of what that might look like. Well, it's going to be no surprise to you this morning, but this morning I want to begin with a story. I want to paint the picture. The picture. Here it is. The sun was up high. The sky was blue. It was a Sunday morning. It was, it was beautiful. It was a radiant day. It was a high day of the week for a lot of folks. You know, Sunday is. There was a gathering underway. People were making their way to church. On this particular morning, a very elderly woman walked into the local country church. And the friendly usher there noticed she was brand new to the congregation, didn't recognize her, hadn't seen her ever. He greeted her at the front door and he helped her up the flight of steps. And he asked her a question, ma'am, where would you like to sit? He asked very politely. And her response was, down front. That's where I want to sit. I want to sit on the very front row, please, sir. And he answered, ma'am, I don't think you really, ma'am, I, I just want to say, I don't think you really want to do that. The pastor is really boring. And when he gets to preaching, man, he spits all over the place. Now, I don't think you need to go there, ma'am. Well, after a long pause, the little lady inquired, Sir, sir, do you know who I am? And obviously, she was very annoyed. And he answered, No, 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 I have no clue, ma'am. She said, I am the pastor's mother. And then the usher replied, Ma'am, I have a question for you. Do you know who I am? Of course, she answered, No, I have no idea. And the usher responded, good, as he tucked tail and he beelined it for the parking lot. Hey, funny story. Hey, it's all about identity. And that's where we're going this morning. We want to talk about our identity as a Christian. We want to talk about who we are. What makes us who, who we are? What's our DNA as a Christian? Uh, Jesus, we, we, we all know, was a carpenter. However, he was more than a carpenter. Jesus was a builder. And he was very aware of the necessity of a substantial, strong, well-constructed foundation, regardless of the building, where it's a home or it's a, it's, a, it's a marketplace building, the substantial foundation was necessary. He was also a teacher, and Jesus was obviously in a league all his own. Uh, when he taught, he taught strong. He ta taught with power. He taught with a life application. He provided truth, which was which would stand up under the, the, the spiking pressure and stress of life. It, it, relentless pressure didn't change his teaching. Speaking of teaching, Jesus is recorded in the book of Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 24, and he speaks there as a builder, as a carpenter regarding foundation. I want to read that scripture to you. The Bible says, anyone who listens to my teaching, Jesus speaking, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse the Bible says, with a mighty crash. Well, for the next several moments, our focus will be, be on three deep foundational piers, if you will, intended within the, the life of every genuine disciple of Christ. Now, I want us to grasp and put into place these three piers. Uh, they need to be a part of our everyday foundation. They are going to support us. They will support us. They've been proven with a passage of time, they will hold up under direct hits. They will hold up under the hardest hits of life. However, when we omit them, when we blink, when we make excuses, I heard this week past that the average person in America, how they know this, I have no clue, makes over 2,200 excuses a year for why they're not stepping up and doing or becoming or whatever, achieving whatever their life goes on. They're just not there. We make excuses. Uh, 
if we omit these strong peers, there will be great forfeiture in our life. It'll be huge. As we're all aware, identity, uh, we're going to talk about identity for the next few months. Identity theft is rampant. And, and, and identity theft, if we get it wrong or someone uh, uh, comes in and, and steals our identity, it proves to be very devastating. It can be used, for instance. Identity theft can be used to darken one's name, uh, darken one's reputation. Identity theft can come along and open and abuse one's credit accounts. Identity theft can even be used to file fraudulent tax returns. No doubt there are those that are listening this morning, uh, watching online, that are able to raise your hand and say, I'm very familiar, I'm sorry, but I've been hit with identity theft, and you know the downside of, no, uh, of identity theft. Now, there are a lot of people that can vouch for that. Uh, I want you to listen closely, because sin and Satan and even self can be portals. They can be gateways, if you will, which rob us of our identity. They can actively and tragically defile one's true impact. We are Christians are created to become and to be and to live as people of impact, difference makers. Grasping foundational truth, scriptural truth, biblical truth is life and death. And yet sometimes we're so uh, we're so uh, uh, just like cavalier about the whole thing that we'll decide our own rules, we'll live by them, no one's going to tell me what to do. And when we do, there's great forfeiture. In Hosea, the prophet Hosea tells us in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it mentions no words. The Bible says, my people are destroyed. My people perish because of a lack of understanding. Uh, some translations say, my people perish for a lack of knowledge, meaning there is destruction as we reject the Lord. There is, there's a downside to this. It's a heavy weight. As we reject the Lord and as we reject the Lord and His point on instruction, uh, we seem to fall apart like a cheap suitcase. And there's no, it's, it's obvious to understand that God is meant to be a part of our life, the heart of us. We're going to initially dive into a prison epistle written by the Apostle Paul, one of three or four, while he was under house arrest, most think, in Rome. I want you to listen closely because it's packed with some really major doses of foundational, there's that word, foundational truth. Truth having to do with each believer's true identity. So we're going to be turning to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading this morning from verse number 1, Ephesians 2, 1. The Bible says, And you he made alive. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So somewhere along the way, in a prison, Paul, armed with a quill and ink and parchment, began to pen truth. And that truth has become and is intended to be, to a Christian, very much like oxygen, that we become dependent upon it. Now I want to talk about true identity as a Christian. Peer number one. Peer number one, only in Christ are we able to experience True life. I'm going to say that a second time. Only in Christ are we able to experience true life. You see, birth is mandatory 
to the entirety of life designed by God. Amazingly, Jesus explained the full spectrum of life intended as requiring not only initial birth, but a second birth. Jesus says, we all require an all new beginning. He wrapped it up. He's teaching this profound truth by way of the term being born again or having experiencing second birth. Every true Christian must be born again. It's baffling, but it's true. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 in the New King James Version phrases it like this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is a, this is a, a spiritual uh, point of a spiritual attack by our enemy. Understanding our salvation, understanding our relationship with God, understanding the true purpose of life, understanding the great peers of Scripture. This is a key point of spiritual attack by our enemy. He desires to sow water and promote seeds of doubt. He loves to go there. He, like, he, he loves to create that. He wants to, to breathe and to, and to breed a culture of doubt, a disruptive thoughts, attempting to destroy, uh, d destroy the peace of mind that we're intended to have. Uh, destroy. He, he loves to enter. He's like a lightning bolt. He loves to burst in on the scene and, and destroy our joy and, and destroy our assurance, our personal assurance of rescue. The epicenter of his attack is to place and promote cracks in our spiritual foundation, taking us out of the reality of living assured. He wants to erase. He wants to scrub it. He wants to mess it up. He wants to minimize our personal assurance. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy regarding the victory that is intended and is possible in Christ. To counter the attack to the enemy, we must embrace the truth that God is fully sufficient that the Lord can be counted on, absolutely counted on. We must settle the question that He, His love, His grace are far greater. They far surpass our lostness. Uh, they, they far surpass our corrupt character, they, 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 our cracked up, overbuilt intelligence. They, God exceeds our self-sufficiency. Yes, only He is the genuine author and grantor and source of true life, and yet we have pundits on every corner that try and sell us and promote another way of life. This isn't only, my friends, this is the exclusive, this is the narrow way, this is the part that causes contention. There is no room for double-mindedness here. The one who walked out of his own grave is fully able to rescue and sustain us. That needs desperately to be settled, and it will be a point of attack. The enemy will come and try and steal, kill, and destroy the assurance of our heart, and the assurance of our salvation. Count on it. Drive that peer deep. Count on God. The second peer, and one which is closely aligned, only in Christ, only in Christ are we truly, are we genuinely forgiven. A second very common arena of attack has to do with our bout with unforgiveness. Putting to rest our past losses. Uh, dealing with our hellish, that's a strong word, putting to death our hellish sinful life by ways of our word, spoken word, our thought, our deed. We've blown it on every, every hand. Some, it seems worse than others. Make no mistake, the great dragon of Revelation chapter 12 intends to cause every believer, all of us, he is merciless, he, do, he wants all of us to go ahead and tap out. His intentions for all of us are to retreat defeated by remembering, by, by, by creating anguish through our memories, uh, to, create, to forever be tormented and haunted by our own list of undeniable sin. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've got it. It's a plague. He wants to go there. He wants to punch rewind. He wants to focus us on it. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 correctly labels our spiritual enemy as the accuser of the brethren. 
Boy, that breaks it down. In other words, he is the one that comes against and makes rails and makes accusation against us. He finds great pleasure in whispering or shouting or reminding or taunting us of our own unspeakable, undeniable list of shameful sin. He wants to remind us of its reality and, and its terrible weight. And the weight of sin is enormous, too much for our own shoulders. And should we listen and should we linger with his taunts and the remembrances and his accusations as they begin to take root, deep root, we are swallowed up and we are captured by our past. It happens all the time. He deals, he wants to bring in doubt, he wants to bring in railing, he wants to break us down, his intentions are to, are, are to break us down step by step, step by step, causing our foundation to collapse. And have you discovered, because it's the way of man, have you discovered that the attempted denial of our sin is no help whatsoever? We, we try to put it out of our mind, we try to erase it, but, but, but something, our defense requires second birth assurance in fact, in John chapter 3, verse 3, we arrive on the scene and we hear Jesus making uh, the best of a man by the name of Nicodemus' inquiries. As we read, the scripture says, Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is, here's that term, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's exclusive. Listen closely to his word and authority. And, 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 and let's, I'm going to read several scriptures and I want us to hang on to it. Let it be rebar within the foundation of our life with Jesus. This is stuff that's meant to, uh, to prop us up, stand us up, give us strength in the storm. These are the areas that, again, the enemy is beating against, coming in. It's in John, 1 John 1, 9. Many of you can repeat it. You can go there. But this is the stuff that needs to stick to our spiritual bones. If we confess our sins, and that's more than admitting, confessing is having a brokenness about it. I am sorry about it. I'm ashamed of it. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we can believe God. I mean, we may lie to ourselves or we may have relationships where people lie or half-step or half-truth. God is dead on on His Word. He tells us we'll confess it, He'll forgive us. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, the English Standard Version, the Bible says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. In Isaiah, the Old Testament, the prophet says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, the New King James Version, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. What an invitation. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are like a red, like crimson, they shall be as wool. One more scripture, Psalm 103, verse 12, English Standard Version. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We dare not believe the lie. We, near, we, we just don't need to go there. We don't need to enter, entertain it. We don't need to nurse and rehearse it. Uh, what is that lie? The, the, the lie is my sins are greater than his forgiveness. I mean, he taunts us. He rolls it out to us. He wants us to hang on to it. It's like weights around our neck when we're swimming in the middle of the ocean. That's a lie when he tells us my, my, my sins are greater than his forgiveness. It's a, it's a lie that's attempting to take root. For our forgiveness to be doubted, our true identity becomes in jeopardy. And so we go around hoping that I've been forgiving, hoping I've given my life and committed my life to Christ and hoping that He's saved me. For our forgiveness to be doubted, our true identity is being shaken. One of my favorites, man that's gone to be with the Lord. Many of you have heard him preach. He's still on television and for good reason. Dr. Adrian Rogers once shared the account of Martin Luther and his bout, his personal bout, Martin Luther's personal doubt with, uh, bout with doubt and depression. He said it was so real, Luther said he was uncertain, he was actually uncertain if he was experiencing a vision or a dream or some kind of face -to -face, actual face-to-face -face encounter with the devil. It was real. He was being swamped by it. Long story short, Luther was confronted by Satan who showed him, showed Luther an actual list, a long list, a lengthy list, 
almost unending list of Luther's personal sins. Big, small, and in between, black, white, whatever you label you want to hang on it. It was all there. It was even uh, with the place and the date included, he said. Even the burden and shame of Luther remembering this, looking at it, being taunted by it, it, it crushed him. Luther's testimony was, I felt crushed in my mind, my emotions, my soul. It was too heavy. It was too much. The dragon and his accusations were simply overtaking him. And then, Luther says, that God told him a very strange thing. He said, address the devil. He said, I just knew he was prompting me to address the devil and tell the devil to unroll the scroll. Had a scroll there with his sin on it, dated in place. Unroll the scroll and show you every last sin. Luther could hardly believe God was prompting him to do that. Hardly able or willing, Luther took Satan. Uh, he, he told Satan, his battle took, can this be true? I don't want to see anymore. I don't want to be reminded anymore. And yet God was, his word was true. He told Satan to unroll the scroll. To which Luther said he balked. The devil balked. He flinched. He refused to follow Luther's instruction. And so what did God do? God nudged Luther a second on a second occasion, and he told him, command him in the name of Jesus to unroll the scroll. He said on the second time, Satan reluctantly obliged. And as he did, Luther said it was, it was too much. He said he felt as if he were slipping into hell itself. The remembrances... And as he filed through it, one after another after another, and he replayed it in Luther's mind, he said, finally, he came to the end of his sin list. And after the last sin was revealed, there it was, Luther's reprieve, paid in full and totally forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus. Hallelujah! He was free. It was even said at the time in one of uh, the, the homes that Luther lived in at the time, he became so angry at the devil and his taunts before this that he'd actually taken up an inkwell and thrown it and splattered it against the wall. And even after these hundreds of years, the inkwell splat's still there, and this was the explanation. He found relief when the Lord shared with him the efficiency, the power of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, he was free. The third peer only in Christ are we empowered to be about God works. Only in Christ do we have the power to address and become involved in God works. You see, our new life, and we got to get this, our new life in Christ is absolutely packed with purpose. And we mustn't be robbed of it. When we lose purpose, when we lose focus, when we, lo we, we lose, it's too much, it's too great a forfeiture. Only in Christ are we able to somehow be empowered to be about God works. Uh, God's design for our life is huge. It, 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 God's design is actually a part of our identity. It's intrinsic within us. It comes with God. It's a part of us. We are not called and equipped for busyness. And although we live in a world that's absolutely busy, that's not the call. The high call of God is to become a person of impact. We are designed by God to become, all of us, all of us are designed by God to become a difference maker. Uh, however, too often uh, we are beat back to the sidelines of life and we simply, or we simply retreat there for whatever reason, our spirit faints. We have no more endurance. We have no fire. We have no power. In essence, we quit. We tap out. We lay down. We go AWOL. Uh, somewhere along the way, we have believed and or adopted a lie as our lifestyle. God could not have a purpose of impact for me in my life. We have somehow given up the God dream. Maybe we've never, in many cases, we, we've been duped. We've never even identified the God dream. We, we need help. We've never embraced it. We've never taken the first step in it. But other times we've been about it, and for whatever reason, it slipped between our fingers. We've given up on it. We refuse to believe that God has actually placed us on His A-team. You see, we've adopted the mantra too often of, of possibly Moses or Gideon. Who, me? 
Really? I mean, we believe that God's greats have to be, surely to goodness, I mean, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to be a preacher. Or, or, or maybe a great orator, a teacher. That's what you've got to be to be great in the kingdom of God. Uh, you need to be, I tell you what you need to be, you need to be a, a missionary. You need, to go, you need to go across the ocean or go across the country or you need to find yourself downtown in a soup kitchen somewhere. That's what you want to be. You want to be a missionary. Or maybe some of us say, well, and I'm not a preacher, teacher, or missionary, but I tell you what I am. I can sing like a songbird. And for whatever reason, we believe that those are the, the handful of categories that, 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 that make us great in the kingdom of God. That is a lie. I mean, for some of us, that's true. But when we've swallowed that, when we've swallowed the lie that you've got to be a preacher or a teacher or missionary or soloist, and that's it. That's an exclusive list. Somehow we have swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. We're in bad shape. God has purpose for us. I, we don't need to be wasting another day or week or month or year. We've got to, we've got to seek God. We've got to be God chasers, so to speak. We've got to be apprehended by God and discover His purpose and begin to be about it. There's so much more than these three peers to build a strong, substantial foundation in our life. But these three are a great starting place. This morning, I want to... I want to close. I want to go there. I've reminded of a story this last week, and it, I think it's great, and I think it's really relevant to where we are right now. I want to replay it. It was the middle of the night, late night, and bam, something happened. Uh, in fact, something jarred the house and, and woke up both parents. Man, they didn't know what happened. They, they jumped out of the bed, and they scurried into their, their little daughter's bedroom. And they looked down on the floor, and there she was. They found her on the floor beside her bed. And obviously, obviously their daughter had fallen out of bed in the middle of the night. Well, quickly they checked her out, and they could see that she was shaking, but she was A-OK. -okay. They asked her if she had any idea. Honey, what happened? Do you have any idea why you've fallen out of bed? Her answer was classic. She said, yes. I know why I fell out of bed. They said, why did you fall out of bed? And they said, she said, I guess I just fell asleep too, too close to where I got in. Oh, what a thought. How true in the lives of so many disciples of Christ. We simply fell asleep too close to where we got in. Dear Christian, dear believer, dear church of the living God, now is our hour. This is our time, no time for sleep. We, armed with truth, armed with assurance, armed with the authority of God and His Word, the very best awaits us. The fields are truly white. The need and opportunities are absolutely significant. We don't have to go around the world. They're at our footsteps. They're in our neighborhood. They're at our place of work. And now I encourage each of us to, to settle some basic questions in our life to wrestle with them no more, to believe God over the lies and taunts of the enemy. Know and walk in our true God-given, God-gifted identity. As we do, our past limitations will be erased and the possibilities will soar. The lid will be lifted and it will astound everybody in our bubble. In fact, I believe it will actually cause heaven to take note. This morning you may be wrestling with some of these doubts. You don't know your purpose. You're not. You're hoping you're forgiven. You're hoping you somehow God has forgiven you and placed you into the kingdom. But today, you know, the Bible says we're saved by faith. Faith. There's a faith step. Oh, the reason is a great thing. Study to show yourself approved unto God. That's a good thing. Come, let us reason together. Those are great invitations. Engaging the mind. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. That's great. Do it. We need our minds engaged for Christ. But there's always going to be that faith element. There's going to be that portion of the bridge to God that we simply trust God and believe Him. This morning, I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey. I don't know whether Christ is reigning and ruling in your life. I don't know whether somehow He slipped. We, we, we turned from Him. We've, we pushed Him back a ways. He's not, that's not that fire burning like it used to be. It, it, it happens, folks. I don't know if we're like Luther battling over depression and doubt. I don't know if we've lost purpose. We're off course. We're going haywire. I don't know. But why not today? Let's nail it down. The fields are white unto harvest. And the church 
needs to respond in love today and is and will be. Father, I thank you today for this special service. I thank you for the three peers of truth. I pray that as we wrestle through these, that to God be the glory, we will have ultimate victory. We'll walk in obedience and we'll be strong unto you, pleasing you in everything we do. Lord, this morning I just pray you dispense great grace because well, that is where we're saved by grace. And I pray this morning, even as people are watching, that they will make the decision. Those that need to will make the decision, maybe for the very first time, to, to invite you into their heart. Lord, I am sorry for my sin. It is, it, I, it's shameful. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin and become my Lord and Savior. There are others of us that say, Lord, I've walked with you. I've been baptized. I know the route I could preach and teach. In fact, I have. I've sung in the choir. I've done it all. But my heart, the embers of my heart, the love in my heart has faded. My spirit has fainted. I, 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 I'm, I'm in the lukewarm. I'm even growing cold. Lord, I pray you'd restore it and great, work a great revival in the church and awakening in the land. And we pray all this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Bless you.